Good Wednesday morning to you. As we continue on this Holy Week and focusing on the Triduum, that is the three worship services that really make up one worship service, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. Today I want to talk a little bit about Good Friday. There's some words that we use as part of Good Friday that we may have never actually explained or articulated, and, and I thought this might be a great opportunity to talk through a little bit of that. Um, one of the things that we do on Good Friday is have a ten embrace service. That means as the service continues on, it becomes darker. Now, this happens in most mainline uh, type of uh, Christian expressions, the Roman Catholic Church, the Methodists, Lutherans, Anglicans, they all use uh, ten embrace services in various forms. Um, the Methodists, for instance, have 14 candles that they extinguish over the course of the, the service. Uh, Anglicans not only do a ten embrace service for Good Friday, but it actually is from Monday, Thursday through Good Friday to it becomes darkest. In our expression of Christianity through Lutheran lens, we use the ten embrace service, especially with Christ's last seven words from the cross. And as each word is spoken, another candle is extinguished, the service becomes darker until it ends. Now there's a key element to a ten embrace service in that it ends with a loud noise. I have to tell you, I'm not quite a fan of the loud noise. I don't like to get scared and I don't like to jump. And even when I know it's coming, it always catches me off guard. But it, it's part of the service, and it is symbolic of the stone being rolled over the grave. It's symbolic of the earthquake that happens when Christ dies, takes his last breath on the cross. And so the, the symbolism that happens in that is meant to invoke the senses and bring meaning to the worship service. Now, as we think about Tenenbrae in this tridum, this three-aspect part of celebrating Christ's passion and resurrection, um, there's one detail that just always gets me between Maundy Thursday and Good Friday. And today, as part of our Lenten devotional, as we focus on this Holy Week, I thought it would be kind of neat to focus on that. So if you're looking at the Gospel of John, in the 13th chapter, we have Jesus having his last meal with his disciples. Now, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, something we call the Synoptic Gospels, they all place Jesus having the Passover dinner with his disciples. The Gospel of Luke is actually one day off. The Passover happens the next day when Jesus is on the cross. Why? Well, there's lots of theological uh, quandaries, explanations, reasoning for it, but we're not going to get into any of that. Just know that the Passover is one day off in the Gospel of Luke than it is in, uh, sorry, in the Gospel of John than it is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But if you turn to John chapter 13, Jesus has just had uh, his dinner with his disciples. He speaks his, about his death in chapter 12. We get into chapter 13. He washes all of his disciples' feet and he gives them um, this new opportunity to gather together. In chapter 13, of, uh, beginning with verse 21, Jesus then tells, he foretells his betrayal. After saying this, he was troubled in spirit. Very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon and Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, do quickly what you are going to do. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, buy what you need for the festival or that he should give something to the poor. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to end us with verse 30. But as we end in 29, there's a couple of things that are happening here. Uh, first of all, in the Gospel of John, the Lord's Supper is not instituted. So when we think about Monday, Thursday, and we think about um, Jesus instituting his Last Supper, what we now understand as Holy Communion, that doesn't happen in the Gospel of John. Instead, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. 
And if you're following the narrative, Jesus has now washed Judas's feet. He's started to um, profess to them, to proclaim to them. He prays with them and he becomes troubled in spirit. What's interesting about the Gospel of John is that while he doesn't institute his, the Last Supper, the Lord's Last Supper in remembrance of his body and blood given and shed for us, he, he does commune Judas. He takes bread, he dips it in the wine, and he gives it to Judas. There's a symbolic act here that following the narrative of the other Gospels reminds us that even Judas, even Judas, Jesus knowing what he was about to do, knowing the betrayal, knowing that Satan was part of the decision Judas was making, Jesus still offers him a distinction and a blessing. Jesus washes his feet. He offers him a distinction and blessing. And there's, there's this moment here where, where Jesus acknowledges and Judas sees that Jesus is acknowledging what he's supposed to do. Sometimes I think we wrestle in faith. We wrestle with why, why doesn't God take more of an active role in preventing us from doing the dumb stuff we do that gets us into trouble? Why does God allow suffering to happen? Why does God allow bad things to happen? Well, this is the fundamental question of faith, and it's no different for us than it was for Jesus. Had Jesus stopped or intervened with Judas, he would not have fulfilled what he came in the world to do. That in, in an odd sort of way, Judas, God works through the brokenness of Judas to bring about the promise he once made. Did it have to happen like that? No, God could have found another way. But God worked through the brokenness of Judas to bring about what was promised, what was foretold, what Jesus had come into the world to do. Now here's where I always get caught in thinking about Judas, thinking about what he did and, and even what he realized he might have been doing in the moment. Because in verse 30 of John chapter 13, it says this, So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. Darkness covers once Judas leaves. That is both uh, symbolic as it is practical, right? It's evening time, they've had their dinner, but now Judas has left and it is dark. There's at least one theologian that has argued the original sin that happens in the garden isn't just Eve biting into the apple. There's at least one theologian that has argued that Eve was left to be tempted by herself. We read in Genesis 3 that she bit the apple or she bit the pomegranate or she bit the fruit and she handed it to her husband, but that he was at least an arm's length away, right? He wasn't there to support her. And if you remember back to Genesis 1, both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, both creation stories, we are created to be in community with one another. And when our community is broken, when we are separated from each other, that is the opportunity for darkness to settle in. That's the opportunity for the devil to be at work. Like sheep, the devil loves to scatter us so that we can be disoriented, that we can be um, distracted, and we can lose our way according to the one who promises to guide us. Every time I think of Good Friday, I think about this one verse that when Judas left, it became dark. There was a sadness and a darkness that he was no longer part of the 12. Whether his heart had been in the ministry or whether he had been distracted, whatever was going on within Judas, the reality is, is that when he was no longer part of the 12, the things changed and there was a darkness and there was a reality uh, that he was missing. And that's kind of a sad aspect to the Good Friday text. It reminds us the importance of being in community. So when you celebrate on Good Friday, whether you're in person at 1030 and 730 or whether you watch the service online, maybe you have your own Good Friday worship celebration that you're invited to, I want you to think about the light and the darkness that exists in your life. I want you to think about and reflect on those moments when, when darkness seems to consume. Is it because you're going at it by yourself? 
Is it because you've left Jesus along the way and, and maybe even the community God has blessed you with to help you navigate the struggles of this life? There are so many details and so many, uh, so much richness that happens in our Good Friday worship. But today, as you prepare, as you think about it, I just want to highlight that one aspect. To be in community with one another is to bring life and light. And when we are separated from that community, when we go on our own path, when we take things into our own hands, it is dark. It's dark for us. And it's dark for those for whom we leave as well. That's part of the gift in Good Friday is the reminder of who both God creates us to be and restores us to be through him. Have a great Wednesday. We'll see you tomorrow.